That's good. I hear I hear people joining. Um, all right, we're going to get started here now. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to our discussion on harnessing the power of data to unlock the full potential of cell and gene therapies. As we develop these transformative treatments, um, they continue to reshape healthcare and understanding um, and effectively communicating their value proposition has never been more critical uh, to us. And today uh, we are here in this panel to discuss how data can truly bridge the gap between scientific promise and real world impact for patients. I think that's a topic that comes up quite often and uh, we're all excited to talk about it. So before I introduce my panelists, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Robert Sexton. I'm the Vice President of Program and Alliance Management at Mustang Bio. Uh, Mustang Bio is a clinical stage biotech where we are developing autologous CAR-Ts. We have in vivo CAR-Ts in development and, um, and actual uh, gene therapy as well. Um, I spent about 20 plus years in the pharma and biotech industry. Um, I spent the majority of my time working for Novartis. Um, that's how I had my exposure to cell and gene therapy, where I got to participate in the launch of the Kimraya product um, in 2017. Um, in 2019, I left Novartis to work with Legend Biotech in alliance with Janssen, where we developed and launched uh, Carvicti. And now I am uh, working on Autologous, as I said, with uh, Mustang Bio. Um, I'm excited to introduce our panelists. We have a lot of experience on this panel. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to start introducing folks on the panel. So uh, Joanna, would you like to uh, go first? Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those not in the US. Uh, my name is Johanna Rossell. I am the general manager, SVP, and head of the rare disease franchise for Sumitomo Pharma. Sumitomo Pharma, as you know, a Japanese company that has presence in the US with uh, in different franchises, one of them uh, in the neurological space, but uh, ours is a rare disease. Um, I am originally from Venezuela, so when you hear the accent, you know where I am from. But my career, more than 20 years, has been uh, divided between Switzerland and mostly in the US. Also, like Robert, started at Novartis, and um, I have worked for Merck, Biogen, and now at Sumitomo Pharma. Um, our um, concentration, where we will be talking about today, is in, in the space of regenerative medicine, tissue-based, which is the experience that we have, and I'm excited to tell you everything that we have learned and uh, the things that we'd like to improve in this space. All right, uh, Evan, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm uh, Evan Unger. I'm a professor emeritus of radiology and biomedical engineering. Uh, I'm an inventor um, on more than 130 issued U.S. patents, and you know I, I like to develop new technologies. And uh, I'm particularly interested in trying to use different kinds of energy to interact with uh, nanoparticles to then deliver materials. Uh, to cell specific sites. And so I think this has a lot of applications uh, for uh, gene therapy and cell based therapeutics. And I've uh, led development of three FDA approved drugs. And one of those is the world's number one selling injectable micro bubble. Well, it's approved for echocardiography, it's being used in clinical trials to open the blood brain barrier for gene delivery and uh, to do gene delivery in other organs. I'm uh, working on uh, a new next generation of uh, nanobubbles, which are, you know, say, 100 nanometers in size and can package genetic materials or be uh, uh, put into cells to then interact with energy, in particular ultrasound, uh, to uh, then deliver the materials uh, to specific sites. So. I'm um, uh, and very familiar with the different kinds of uh, energy that we might use. I've served as a permanent member in the past of the uh, gene therapy uh, study section at uh, NIH, and I'm very pleased to be here with uh, the distinguished group today. Thank you. And uh, Jason, would you like to round out the introduction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Uh, Jason Lott. I'm at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. I um, head up our integrated evidence generation shop for specialty medicine and cell and gene therapy globally. 
that includes, you know, rare diseases as well as more common diseases uh, under development for either cell or gene therapy. Uh, I'm a dermatologist, uh, still in practice, actually, and a health services researcher by training. And so I really like real world evidence and data. I'm really happy to be here. I feel like we should start our own biotech after what Dr. Unger just said. So I'm pretty engaged and enthusiastic to be here. So um, and yeah, you know, really focused on use of real world data applications to, you know, clinical trial development programs um, and, you know, obviously all that uh that, that happens after approval uh, is of great interest to me. And so I'm um, happy to be here and learn. So thank you. All right. So, so um, thank you for the introductions. Um, great, great diverse background we have here. We have the whole spectrum of development and commercialization represented here. And I think, you know, the purpose of, of our conversation today to really talk about value proposition specifically in cell and gene therapies. I think everyone that has worked in the industry has seen the shift that's happening in the paradigms related to the treatment of, of various diseases. You know, initially, I think the big splash was in oncology, but you see um, the industry is starting to branch out now into various other uh, disease areas, and each one of them has its own existing standard of care. And these therapies are disrupting that standard of care, as well as the, the mechanisms by which the treatments are administered, the purchasing. And so with that, our first question is really, how do you see data fundamentally reshaping the landscape of the value proposition in cell and gene? Um, Joanna, would you like to take this one first? Yeah. So let me give you some background on, um, on you know, what we have done and how we see data and how data have helped us, but um, or the learnings that we have. So we have one of the first regenerative medicines that were approved in the U.S., and it's called Rotimic, it's for congenital atomic and ultra rare disease for children that uh, are born without thymus. Without thymus, you can't, um, they don't mature T cells, therefore um, their life expectancy because of infections and all of this is between two to three years old. So Rotimic came to be approved uh, based on um, our the academic center um, data on clinical trials they have done for many years, but uh, they didn't have a way to put it together as a package to go to the FDA and actually show that with this data, you could uh, prove that you are better, you know, like that you are giving the efficacy and saving the kids us to get approved. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, apply to us and apply to everybody in these very difficult diseases where, you know, children or patients will die, like uh, the mortality rates are high, so, and there are low prevalences. So how do you make sure that like the data that you have, you know, like is strong enough to, to get approval, to get support from payers in the future? So one of the first things that we did was to actually collect and try to, you know, like use um, technology to ensure that even though you didn't have a placebo as an academic center, you were able to show, you know, like natural history studies that will com were compared with the technology that you were developing. Um, no. Besides, uh, you know, like having the data to get approved in our case, um, there was a commitment with the FDA to continue to generate the data and the real world data and registries that are needed after, you know, you get the, um, the, the final approval are going to be key, especially for those brands that uh, don't have and those medicines don't have, don't have, like we had like 20 years of experience with the academic center. But uh, what the FDA and, um, you know, payers and everybody that is looking at your value proposition wants to see is you have a commitment to actually generate this data, that you're not going to just be based on extrapolations or, or you know, like uh, other, um, you know, standards that could be already in the system, but that you are, um, you you will promise to follow these patients and ensure that, um, you know, you can, you're, you demonstrate that you're changing standard of care. Um, I feel that um, one of the main things that help us in this case, and um, I think we will talk more about it uh, during this conversation, is our ongoing conversations with the FDA. We have an opportunity as gene and cell I know the FDA doesn't have tons of resources, but um, through 
getting the, the RMAT designation, it allow us to have more interactions with them. And I will talk more about how we went about getting this, um, you know, the, the pathway to get approved. Sure, sure. I think I think um, you stated a couple interesting points there, and and you kind of have the traditional approval pathways are are being leveraged, but then non traditional recommendations and requirements are being imposed, and you see those requirements finding their way um, into the organization. They're also transitioning over to your customers as well as to the patients, right? So the ecosystem of support. And, and the requirements for gathering and collecting this data is evolving pretty quickly. I think it's quicker than infrastructure can keep up with. Um, so, you know, how do you deal with those issues when you're trying to understand your product, right? Just like every other developer is, but then you're also trying to demonstrate value in a way that probably has not been done before. And, and I think, um, I think we all wrestle with that. So do you guys want to, you know, continue that line of thought and let's expand specifically on, how are you leveraging data to specifically address those challenges without increasing the burden to the ecosystem? So, Jason, do you want to provide some perspective? I think uh, in our case, um, we needed to to ensure that we partner not only with you know with the FDA to understand the differences. But also when we were looking at partners outside, because our disease is so ultra rare, we need to educate people to then come and understand the data in a different way that you will never have in a like typical clinical trial. And being able to combine different uh, researches that were, do were done and provide that as a clinical trial, not as you think in the past that you have, you know, your placebo, you have your, your, your leg with your, uh, with your treatment. Uh, it was a lot of education to get the buy-in, but also uh, working on new ways of presenting the data that uh, it's going to be needed because we are ultra rare and we would never have like uh, cohorts that are hundreds or thousands of people. But I, I know Jason has. Yeah. No, look, I mean, that's just a, I completely agree. And um, things are just changing quickly, right? And so I think the expectations of what data are available, the quality of those data, and how they can be applied either to support, you know, clinical development programs, registration, downstream access with payers or HTAs is, is just quickly accelerating. Uh, and, um, you know, if you even in parallel to that, you know, a lot of standardization has occurred in terms of data transfer, which is facilitating collaborative partnerships, which previously may have been more difficult to execute. And I think that's leading to opportunities to scale uh, data collection for evidence generation um, for regulatory use or, or market access use. And um, in parallel to that, right, there's been a lot of advancement systems under the, you know, under mathematics, right, in terms of how we can actually squeeze more out of these data, whether it's construction of, you know, external comparator arms in parallel to trials to, for payer purposes, and, and maybe, you know, line extension uh, with reg regulatory authorities, or, or whether it's, you know, using those data to help plan the internal uh, pivotal trial uh, operations a lot more optimally or more efficiently, and, you know, calculating effect size, extrapolating data for internal decision-making purposes on the manufacturer side. And so, um, you know, cell and gene therapy is for all of us, and I'm learning a lot myself, you know, it just presents itself, presents with unique challenges. I know we're going to get into maybe talking about long-term follow-up, you know, tokenization, right, is a new opportunity in the U.S. to to execute long-term follow-up potentially for certain cell and gene therapies. And, and these topics, you know, take on additional complexity when we start comparing and contrasting between rare diseases, ultra-rare diseases, which have been forging and carving their own path. Um, and now we see cell and gene therapies for more common diseases emerging in development. And so that's going to, you know, overlay different sets of challenges and opportunities. But I think the expectations are changing of what data can deliver. Um, and that means that, you know, I think we should plan ahead for where the hockey puck is going to be, because traditional uses of these data will remain important, but there will be a competitive frontier where there may be some 
some marginal uh, opportunities at the margin, not marginal, but at the margin uh, to really demonstrate value and uh, hopefully ultimately position these assets best for the patients. Yeah. And I would say that don't underestimate the power of qualitative data. Uh, we were able to educate the FDA and, and other key stakeholders on the, this very uh, complex disease and the narrative of what happens to each of these families that go through, you know, like um, having a newborn screen and having congenital atamia. And um, more and more, I feel those conversations and, uh, and those uh, examples of what qualitative data could do in ultra rare and rare diseases, like the ones that we work in gene and cell, provide um, a complete narrative of what we want to achieve and, and the reason why sometimes we our, you know, like we need to complement what we have as uh, quantitative data. Um, I'd like to take a minute just to one, I want to continue this line of thought, but I also want to invite our audience members to, to put questions into the Q&A box so we can work the questions into the discussion as well to, to make sure we're addressing any specific questions that you have. Um, but I also want to come back to the point about qualitative versus quantitative. And I think, you know, touching on <clears throat> you're, you're introducing diseases that are very low on the uh, spectrum in terms of visibility. Um, people don't know that, that they're out there in some cases and treatments are limited. Um, and then typically the cell and gene uh, products are disruptive um, from the standpoint of the, the standard of care and the typical progression. And I think, you know, um, Evan talked about his technologies, his technologies will likely be that in that disruptive space. So how do you generate that qualitative evidence and, and you know, potentially um, quantitative evidence, evidence to support it? Um, you know, and how do you build those strategies internally and position them externally? Now, th this is an evolving field, but uh, when you're dealing with the ultra rare diseases, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, you've shown you can do this, Joanna, but to have a program uh, where there's uh, no placebo group, you're, you're using real world evidence to compare. But as you, uh, I have two projects um, ongoing in um, orphan diseases, but uh, they are not ultra rare. And in those uh, cases, um, a placebo group is required. And um, the, where you can get um, some advantage is uh, doing one trial as opposed to two pivotal trials in many more common diseases and uh, better interaction with the FDA and so on. But uh, I think as you move from ultra rare to um, you know mainstream orphan diseases and then beyond, you're gonna uh, be required to produce quantitative data. And uh, as this moves forward, uh, I think for reimbursement, you, you, need, you need to show pharmacoeconomic uh, data that that can be you know put into the trial so that you, you you produce it as you go forward. But, um, uh, you know, that's a great achievement to uh, what you've done, Johanna, in uh, the ultra rare diseases. You're fundamentally changing the outcomes in a fatal disease. And, you know, and if the, the data on the clinical trial, which is obviously very important, but um, I think everybody in this uh, call is... Uh, Align that one of the other um, areas where data is needed and is uh, the CMC side of the house is very, you know, like complex manufacturing. Um, sometimes, you know, you have the capability of having your data to, to get support. But um, for example, in our case, we got a CRL based on um, how we were producing our manufacturing. Um, so you understand retime comes uh, from an organ, like a thymus is donated from a kid 
that uh, is nine months of old younger of younger that is having a heart um, surgery. So normally they will dispose the thymuses, but we collect them, process them in a manufacturing facility between 12 to 21 days and uh, is re-engineered to then be put in the tight of um, in the leg of, a, of the child that needs retirement. And it takes between six months to 12 months to regenerate the T cells for the child. So the manufacturing, uh, when we start having the conversations with the FDA, um, you know, it's also new for them. Like you have an organ that you are, it's being re-engineered to be a, a, a product, a medicine for a patient and you need safety and efficacy. So all the data that needed to be uh, created and for the FDA to feel comfortable on how you're doing the, you know, you're actually manufacturing as in their mind is like uh, other kind of diseases where you get the raw materials and then you have always the same safety and efficacy and quality. Um, I would say that part, a lot of, of the um, automatization of data and making sure that we prove to the FDA finally with all the changes that we did, um, that we were able to create something they felt comfortable uh, and you know had the standards that they wanted. It's another area of, uh, you know, now we are in another process of creating a new manufacturing facility and all, all of these, you know, there is nothing but data to prove that to them that we continue to provide the same drug at the same time, which normally, you know, wouldn't be like an issue in other in other um, areas of the industry. So that's right. So we have two questions coming in from the audience that are actually going to extend this this line of conversation. Um, the first one is specifically about how are you gathering data directly from patients. Um, and how should it be gathered given that they are, you know, at the center of, of the therapy? Um, so that's the first question. And then there's a second one that is a, a follow-up specific to natural history control arm. So let, let's start with, let's start with the, uh, the question about gathering data directly from patients. Uh, does anybody want to field this one? Uh, well, I, we have a current trial, um, in glioblastoma where uh, we have a quality of life questionnaire uh, that uh, is filled out by the patients and also by their caregivers. So there's two different quality of life questionnaires and it's filled out at um, certain time points. And uh, there are a number of these kinds of questionnaires that have been designed for different diseases. And so uh, when we uh, submitted the IND the FDA reviewed the um, questionnaires and the time points. And I, it was one of the things that they, they wanted because uh, they, they want the quality of life data. Um, you know, if, if you're improving survival, but decreasing quality of life, then that is a, not a very favorable proposition. Right, <clears throat> right, that's true. And, um you know, thinking about it from from the design of trials and interpretation of, of the data, um, any recommendations there on on how you move forward um, with structuring that that approach? Well, I, I think it's it's increasingly important to have quality of life data in trials, and it's good to develop the uh, interaction with the FDA to get their input. And it's also helpful to work with KOLs, uh, patient advocacy groups, and the patient themselves to see what they think is important and incorporate that into the, uh, you know, into the data gathering so that it's well-defined and it's gonna be obtained uh, rigorously, you know, throughout. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you. We, you know, in, in the few different programs that I've worked on, we've worked very closely with the different advocacy groups. And then as you transition commercially, I think this gets lost a lot in the development, but transitioning commercially, you actually have direct patient interactions and in supporting them through this. And I think to your point, building your clinical programs to, to establish those connections and that understanding early actually helps you know, support your your drugs as they go out into the market. Um, and I, I think you also touched on the, the economic component of it as well. 
And I think, you know, gathering the information early does allow you to be in a position to understand, you know, the requirements of the product earlier, which allows you to prepare and maybe spread the, your own development costs out a little bit over time versus having to take them right at the tail end of, of your development program. Um, one, another question um, that came in that I would like to, to address was um, related to when you're using, um, and apologies, I have to read these live, so it's difficult to multitask. <laughs> Um, when using natural history control arms, is it better to separate rapid progressing disease and slow progressing disease in order to show differences um, in, in candidate technology um, in a short-term observation of the clinical trial? Uh, maybe I can uh, jump in. I think that's a really great question. I um, <clears throat> I think ideally you want to, for these natural, for these any sort of external comparison, right? Using data outside of the within trial design. I think the most important thing to do is try to match as best you can. And so in doing so, one would intrinsically match against, you know, apples to apples, rapid progressors versus potentially slow progressors or, you know, match according to who has the highest risk of an outcome uh, match according to who might have the highest risk to respond to a particular therapy or therapeutic class. And so I think part of that is covered in the matching approach itself. You know, whether one stratifies across those categories is maybe a separate question. Um, but I do think it speaks to maybe just extend that for a little bit. You know, that world of matching is quickly evolving and regulators at some point will, you know, continue to adapt to some of the new newer uh, algorithmic approaches to matching and you know which continue to eat away at residual confounding but also enable you to make sure you're trying to have some sort of you know internal validity uh, with what you're doing and um, that's an area of growth and it connects to that for the prior data topic because you know you can start matching on a lot of stuff now right and um it's not just your, you know, your your father's uh, propensity score these days, right? So, um, you know, things are pretty ch changing quickly. Finally, so I would say match uh, match as well as you can is my answer to that question. I think you tackle uh, both rapid progressors and uh, and slow progressors if I understand the question correctly. Although I'm sure it could be unpacked further. Um, and I just want to say, just reiterate, I fully agree with putting the patient at the center of this. You know, I. Early engagement in trial design, you know, picking the right validated instruments for quality of life measurement. We're seeing a proliferation of digital health technologies. You know, part of I work in movement disorders and neurodegenerative disease. You know, how do we measure that in a seamless manner for the patient? You know, deploying uh, deploying digital health technologies and you know, threading the needle between applications for you know regulatory purposes, but then good enough data for other purposes. You know, maybe payer market access purposes downstream, and and really making sure that these programs are are aligned to the values and the needs of the patient, both within the trial and then you know all that follows after that. And finally, you know, preparing for long term follow up, right? You know, for especially for some more of these you know not ultra rare, maybe not even orphan diseases, but more common diseases where patients have choices about what they want to do, um, you know, am I going to pick this gene therapy or that cell therapy or wait 10 years for the next one? That's one thing they're faced with. Um, but then also, okay, I've gotten it. You know, what are, what's the burden going to be on me to follow up? And I think that that's uh, an important and evolving area because um, there will be competition in the future in some of these uh, therapeutic indications. So, yeah. Um, oh going to add that obviously it depends of the size you now like you want your natural history study um to be big enough to be able to compare that you are actually changing standard of care we always talk about you know like that's so the minimum denominator you need to you are providing innovation but uh, how do you demonstrate that you are better than standard of care so in our case you know if your population is really small you know difficult to ch to divide the natural history on different uh, performers of what happens to these patients. But obviously in other cases could be the case, could be that case. I think what Jason's saying about the registry and um, the voice of the patient and of the, the, the doctors and academic centers or the institutions that are treating the patients, 
I, I would say this is where there is a huge opportunity. I have an academic center treating these very sick kids and you know providing retirement, but also they have all their issues. And on top of that, I am asking them to do a registry. And imagine in our case, it's even more complicated. I'm, I'm, and I'm open to anybody that has an idea how to improve this because these kids are, co are coming to Duke University. Um, that's the only place where they can have the treatment today. As I said before, we are expanding for the future. But today they need to come to North Carolina to get the treatment, but they are coming from every state in the US. And uh, imagine the doctors um, trying to do a registry with information that comes from the different institutions across the different um, uh, places where these kids are originally treated. Um, anything that we could do to make this more automated, you know, like make the data more useful even for the institution or the referring physicians um, is something that we are interested on because we understand like the power of the data is as, as good as they will be committed to do this. But uh, this takes a lot of time and effort, FTEs from, from the hospital to put, you know, like the right data that could be useful for us and, and for them to treat the, um, the kids in the future. So still an opportunity there. Imagine when we have more sites of administration to make sure that everybody's collecting the data in the same way and we don't depend. I once went, went to Duke and the doctor showed me a pile like this of data that the physician, the referring physician sent about the child when they need like seven different things. Like they need to go through all of these inter interpret what they are sending. So think there is an opportunity to do a much better job on collecting data from patients on registry studies and our commitments with the FDA or even as uh, Jason said, with other people that, you know, the government or the payers to continue to show we are providing value. So I heard a couple themes coming out of here, talking about growth, opportunity, innovation, um, you know, I've lived through that myself with, you know, launching, you know, Kim Raya as the first uh, CAR-T product in the market, all of, all of the ecosystem requirements to support the product in, in that environment were absent. Um, and same when, when I worked with, with the team at, at Legend and Jansen and developing the wraparound infrastructure to, to make sure that you can actually execute on the different regulatory requirements, the product requirements, the patient support requirements, the payer requirements, right? It, it adds up, right? Like you just talked about the registry for the patient. So when we talk about each of the different channels that require input coming in, what innovations do you see most impacting the value propositions in cell and gene, um, right? Between you, you have technologies, you have different thinking, you have different uh, algorithms and models, you have different endpoints that are being looked at looking at, um, you know, the long-term savings versus short-term savings, and then comparing standard of care, and then episode of care starts to come into the mix of the discussion as well. Back to Dr. Unger's point about the quality of life scores and changing, hey, they're not in the hospital for six months or a month, or they're here for a day, they get their infusion and they're gone, um, which means they go back to their life for most people. Um, so let's talk about, about the innovations that, let's say for Joanna, what innovations do you require in order to facilitate your, your products? But um, let, let's just, let's expand on that. And I'll work some questions from the audience in as well as, as we go through that and unpack that topic, because I think it's a natural segue here. So um, if we think of cell and gene therapy, you know, you, you want to affect a certain tissue and cells, and um, the the gene therapy, for example, has to enter the cell membrane and usually the nucleus. If if it's an um, an RNA payload, it, it may have to go to the ribosome. Uh, if it's a, a cell therapy product, you want it to go to a certain tissue. And uh, I like the analogy of uh, the post office. You, you know, you're getting, or UPS or FedEx, you're getting a delivery to your mailbox or to your home. And so uh, right now, 
uh, we remove the cells from the person. Uh, we transfect them ex vivo. We may do a um, bone marrow ablation. Uh, we may drill a hole in the skull to then inject the material into the brain. And so, um, you know, I've been working on this most of my career, and uh, I see a lot of potential with it. But using nanotechnology uh, with um, um, molecular biology and uh, energy mediated activation and delivery, so that in the future uh, we can deliver that payload uh, to the desired tissue uh, and to the cells or the cells themselves to that tissue without going through the invasive disruptive processes. And uh, so I think this is the way it's going to go. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in AI and in uh, all of the advances we see in technology. And I think that uh, nanotechnology uh, with molecular biology and energy is going to be used to fundamentally uh, transform uh, the potential uh, to uh, do this less invasively uh, to more different tissues, different kinds of diseases. And uh, right now we're scratching the surface, uh, uh, doing uh, things in ultra rare diseases, but uh, ultimately in the future, you know, I think CRISPR is gonna be deployed to treat common diseases, uh, improve the quality of life. And if we can decrease uh, the long-term care, uh, for example, of Alzheimer's patients um, or stroke patients post-stroke, um, then uh, we can not only improve the quality of life, but decrease the cost of medical care. And I think this technology has that potential. That's, that, I mean, that is fascinating to me, right? Because when you think about you, this doesn't get discussed often, but but the actual arithmetic behind how many patients there are, how many beds are available, how many physicians, and if you could reduce the scale of that or just shift the curve by a certain percentage, you're you're having tremendous impact on you know the the system's ability to support uh, these these patients, and and as I think diseases are. Uh, becoming more prevalent. And I don't know whether that's through sophistication of diagnosis and recognition or just, you know, you know, environmental exposure or whatever those causes are, you see across all the different therapeutic classes, incidence rates are growing. Hospital infrastructure is not able to keep up with the expansion required. And then the delivery mechanisms are ever more sophisticated. So I think the overall goal here is to is to find ways to take waste and burden out of the system in a way that improves life. Um, so I think, you know, when you're thinking about demonstrating that, right, I see paradigm shifts happening in the traditional ways of having those conversations. Um, and I, I think your, your explanation about, about the nanoparticles changing, changing the game with, with the different invasive methodologies, are there other areas or other, other, let's call them like measurement points that you guys see emerging that, will we'll kind of challenge the status quo today from an, maybe from an innovative or, or a different uh, thinking perspective. So if I see it from, from my side of the, you know, like once we are commercializing, I feel that uh, the innovation is a lot of how we work with um, key stakeholders, like from regulators, from payers, patient advocacy groups, um, et cetera. I think like the success we have had with Retimic is based on the data that we were able to, to analyze it from different angles. Like if we're talking with payers, like why are you paying, you know, like the cost of having a sick kid that maybe is gonna be in the hospital most of the year and the outcomes as we know will be fatal. Um, and, but it's, you know, it's not enough to say that this is costing you. It's like, 
how do I demonstrate this? How do I use natural history studies to demonstrate that maybe this is not huge, not on a lot of patients, but each patient um, is costing a lot and it will, this is a one-time um, drug that they are not used to. Like they, their mindset is like how much I'm gonna chronically pay for this uh, product, et cetera. So I would say like, uh, what is different in gene and cell, I feel most of the time we are educating, but we need the data to for our education to be relevant for them. Same with the FDA. We have an example. I told you that the CRL that we got because of manufacturing. But through our interactions, we 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 noticed that we were educating them. They have never approved a timeless-based uh, manufacturing facility that is going to be given to a child. And uh for all of us that have so many years in pharma, like our, if you get a CRL, a complete response, meaning you're not going to get approved, in our mindset is to immediately go and meet with the FDA to see what are the next steps. This is, is incredible. Like, uh, it's very important because, you know, the smaller the company, you don't have a lot of money to wait and see, like, what's next. Um, but even though at that time we were a smaller, a smaller company that um, that was working on, on this development, we realized that having a meeting immediately with the FDA wasn't going to be as effective. From the interactions before, we knew they were learning with us. They, you know, they were trying. We already know knew their mindset, but uh, the fact that we needed to educate them and work with them. So instead of immediately having a take a meeting with them, we took our time which, you know, other people would think, okay, you're wasting time, but that was in terms of understanding how to extrapolate what they have in mind from other um, industry areas to what works in tissue and gene and cell and come with more solutions, you know, not uh, like, okay, what do you think about all of these options? In the past, in all the launches I, I have been, uh, like, we never take a lot of time, but it was needed. And that's like, an innovative way of seeing that the FDA wants to help. Um, they don't have tons of resources, but that might as well go when we have uh, more further data to, to look at choices, not like in the old fashioned way that they will dictate what, um, what quality and CMC standards would be when we are all learning to create this new pathway. I, I like, you know, the way that, that you position that, right, about internal outcomes right and i'm you know working with mustang bio we're, we're a small company right independent um and uh same thing right it's the timing of when do you go and what do you discuss and making sure that you have very clearly defined and articulated your message and supported your message so right getting it right the first time i think that's a great example of, of leveraging your own uh, data and operations to forge your collaboration uh, with the FDA, I see questions coming in too about, you know, across the different stakeholder groups, right? You have the physicians that need to be educated, you have the FDA, uh, you have payers, you have patients. We haven't talked about caregivers. Caregivers factor into this discussion quite a bit. Um, and I think, right, like, I think we've, in, we've hinted on the fact that the value analysis is extending well beyond just the standard, hey, is the drug effective? It's how does the drug have a net impact across a number of different avenues? And so when, when you know, you talk about um, things, I'm going to work a question in here from the audience, because I think, you know, Joanna, you touched on leveraging the RMAT designation, right, to help extend your conversations with the FDA. Um, there's some questions coming in about how you did that. Um, but I think that that what you're talking about being innovative in your internal development approaches, your, your internal strategies and positioning your very, very precious resources to get maximum outcomes. So you can even deliver these products to patients. So, so I'd like to, to weave those two questions together. Yeah. So, so, you know, with the um, ARMAT, you get, um, you know, some privileges of, of having more meetings with the FDA and making sure, you know, there is a series of, of um, areas they want to work because they understand that you know you're bringing innovation for them and like they want the time too to learn more about what you're uh, presenting. So um, yeah, that's what we did. Like uh, we look at the opportunities to propose type A meetings and um, uh, some of 
even today, as I said, like we are um, creating our new our new manufacturing facility. The FDA, uh, when we sent our briefings, because we are in an armad, in two opportunities they have proposed um, informal meetings. So that's a benefit that comes from you know like having your program being uh, approved as a regenerative medicine advanced therapy. Um, and uh, as I said before, we we have taken advantage of that, and um, it's not perfect because obviously, as I said, you know, the FDA doesn't have tons of resources. But uh, as discussed, like the most prepared you are, even with alternatives, um, that will give you like a better time spent with the FDA. I would say that um, one of the other things that um, talking about not only the FDA, but regulator, um, regulations in, in the industry, we have needed to innovate a lot in our patient support program. Um, our patient support program, um, these kids, um, to give you an example, like they, as soon as, we are very lucky in the US because we have newborn screening. With the skit newborn screening, they finally know they have congenital atamia and they immediately need to be in isolation. And when we say isolation, this is before COVID and then everything, everybody in the house need to be isolated. The, the, the siblings need to be homeschooled. One of the parents need to stay home. Um, and um, many of these families, if they have um, a parent that cannot work, you know, works in service, et cetera, it affects them always in many ways. So. Our patient support program helps them, as I said, move from these states um, to North Carolina and coordinate with the academic center. I feel like each step of the way of the of our hub is something that we perhaps need to send to the authorities to see if they feel comfortable because it have never been uh, done before. Um, and that's another area that you know is not related to the FDA, but it's related to how dif how different it is in gene and cell and uh, we can draw just from the hops that we have done in the past even in specialty medicines you're say you're segueing into kind of what our excuse me what our last question was which was like when you talk about the different types of data required and, and the different perspectives on value proposition right um the the patient support services landscape was completely rewritten uh mm -hmm. when Novartis put Kim Raya on the market. Novartis took very, uh, very strong steps to, to lodging themselves behind supporting the patient. And their, the approach challenged existing, you know, government laws and requirements in which, you know, OIG came back and, and issued that guidance letter supporting what Novartis did. But that's that's the field that that we're in with these therapies because you know, the the episode of care changes and the requirements change for the patients and then the the what do we call them the, the stakeholders it, it just expands because now you're you're providing services and support so like it, it becomes you know your product is no longer just the therapeutic agent your product is the entire um operation that that gets your patient identified and treated and then supported post-treatment so let's talk about um, each one of those conversations is incredibly difficult. The data spectrum that's covered is expansive, where you have clinical, preclinical, manufacturing, CMC, you have your real world evidence, you have health economics. Um, that's a big story to put together, and it has to be articulated and told in a very, very precise manner. Um, and, and I know it's kept a lot of us up for many hours. So let, let's talk about how do you break that down? How do you eat the elephant, so to speak? And how do you walk your organization through demonstrating value across those different cuts? And, and where are you drawing source data to do so? It's a big, it's a big question. It's a big topic. Let's, let's just break it down into whatever you think is the best place to start. I think um, identify who are your key stakeholders. You know, they are the key opinion leaders that care a lot about the disease you know, but don't have the time or the resources to dedicate to your to your program, but identify those that will and uh, will support the pathway. You know, I feel that's like one of steps one, like we are even, we're in this 
space of immunology, but even the immunologists don't know that retirement takes 21 days to be produced. Like uh, there is um, a, a knowledge of what um, the drug can do from the efficacy and safety point of view, but there is a lot of other education that needs to be done to, to bring different kinds of key, of, um, key stakeholders. So getting the buy-in that what you're doing is going to actually change standard of care, uh, it gets obviously the support of um, the physicians and healthcare providers that uh, care about these patients that have been caring for these patients before we came to the picture. You know, they are the ones that don't have an option for these patients and, you know, have the sad news that it's just, you know, like um, the standard of care is not good enough. So um, another another area that um, it has been very useful um, for us to get learnings from and also to partner with are the patient advocacy groups. Like, as you may imagine, there is no patient advocacy group for congenital ATAM, it's so small, but don't shy away from, you know, those organizations that, uh, you know, IDF in our case, RARE, um, NORD, like they, their spectrum is bigger, but they care for these patients and they will support somebody that is putting the efforts and the resources to, to find a solution for them. And that has given us visibility and um, also contact to patients that uh, somehow like ended up there without knowing that there is a potential solution for them. Um, obviously that's like first stages when, you know, like in the ecosystem of what we do to get the support starts there with the patients, the caregivers, but most importantly with the physicians that, you know, have known about this disease for a long time. And um, once we got approved, obviously the, the, the role was to make sure that payers also understood. And it's not about us talking about it. Like the best is to show these key opinion leaders, these physicians, families, patient advocacy groups that know the real value and can help you support sell it to, so they, you know, like have a sustainable way of treating the, the patients. So, it's complex, and I, like you, feel that we do send a lot of things to the OIG because it's new. Everything is new. Like yeah, every, everything else makes sense, too. We think this is the right thing. It's not legal today, but we have to do this. <laughs> so um, those are hard challenges to face. Um, you know, Jason or Evan, any any comments that you want to add on this? Because I think... Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was a question about uh, magnetic uh, nanobots and... Um, uh, yes, that's possible in the future, but uh, uh, you know it's hard to focus the magnetic energy to a really pinpoint area. But you can do that by combining more than one energy source, and I think there's a great future for nanomechanical machines uh, in to to really transform the space. And one thing I wanted to mention: it's not as much uh, to the ultra rare diseases, but let's say orphan diseases, uh, diseases are diverse and uh, the genotyping of the disease, you find that there are fundamentally or vastly different outcomes in a given disease, depending on the genotype. And so when you're comparing to real world evidence, then if you use the genotyping to select the historical cohort uh, and this is very important and it's something going to be done more and more in the future. And, and I'm a radiologist, and so we do radiology to look at progression-free survival. And oftentimes, the treatment that you're doing causes effects which are very difficult to uh, distinguish between pseudo-progression and true progression. And a very, I think, uh, interesting area that can be used more in the future is blood-based biomarkers, uh, particularly uh, with DNA and mRNA. Uh, it's already begun to differentiate between true progression and pseudoprogression. And I think this is going to help uh, get patients off of ineffective therapy sooner. And in the future, uh, might be used as a surrogate in term, uh, instead of you know, the, the, what we now use for pseudoprogression, but for um, perhaps uh, even outcomes. And 
particularly for rare diseases uh, where uh, you know it's more difficult to to get a control group. But that's something I wanted to touch upon. That's fascinating. Everything that you're talking about is um, really, really fascinating. And uh, I'd love to hear more about it <laughs> offline for sure. Um, but uh, I'd like to also give Jason the opportunity. He, it looked like you had something you wanted to say. Well, look, I mean, a lot, big topic, a lot to cover. I mean, my, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I have any advice, but um, I think cell and gene therapy, whether you're working in ultra rare or common or something in between forces you to connect the dots early, right? And so when you're doing your from research to early clinical development to your later clinical development and post-launch activities, you know, think as early as possible about the choices you make today and what they will impact in the future. And ask yourself, am I leaving opportunities or value for the various stakeholders on the table when I'm choosing choice A versus choice B. And in the past, I think a lot of those choices weren't even there because of technological uh, you know, constraints, but today a lot of those choices are there. And some people are making those choices and they will be your competitors in the future and, and hopefully everyone benefits, right? And so, you know, we want to compete to bring the, bring the best products to the market for the patients and a lot of that will hinge on data availability. And I'll make a plug again for this idea of linking data together, you know, in a privacy preserving manner. That's on the frontier and that impacts your clinical development programs when you're collecting clinical data, already being able to link them to past real world data for that patient. And obviously that patient will continue to exist in the real world. And so I think we'll see a blending of data for certain purposes, maybe not always for regulatory purposes. That's one example among many. And then the, I guess the other thought I had on that big topic is, um, you know, be prepared to compare, right? I think uh, historically we've got away with not being, you know, forced to compare against what would have happened or understanding the counterfactual better if the patient did not get the therapy. But so maybe it's connect the dots and uh, be prepared to compare. I think that's a good, uh, that resonates with me. It, it aligns with some experiences I've had recently where you start talking about data comparability and you start talking about in these rare indications um, where patient availability is tough and prevalence is tough and accrual of data points is really difficult. I think, I think your point about, and this is kind of my key takeaway from the conversation here um, is that you know, when you're starting your your development, right, at the very early preclinical stages, having to understand like, okay, I'm not going to generate this data and leave it behind. How do I bring this data with me to, to the finish line when I'm submitting my BLA, which could be five years away or more, depending depending on your therapeutic class. And so being able to have your, your as a leader in this, have your teams come together, recognize that what they're doing today is important and has to be right for today, but it also has to be right for five years down the road or tomorrow. Um, and uh, so for me, right, being able to oscillate between the short range planning, the long range planning and understand where we're going and extrapolating um, is, is one of the biggest challenges in, in demonstrating value over that development spectrum. So that, that I'd like to touch with each of you. If you have just a couple seconds, we're almost out of time here. Um, any key takeaways that you want to add um, before before we close? I think very quick building on what you're saying, Robert. Um, we learned this at Novartis, like the target pro profile, <laughs> like even phase one and phase two, like what are, we, what are the data we are collecting? So um, I am the queen of the target pro profile and I learned that <laughs> many years ago, like it's never too early because that's the data that will demonstrate the value and it needs to be in paper and multifunctional and we all, all agree this is what we are going to get out of uh, these trials or you know, where we are in the pro I agree with Johanna. You start with the target product profile and then that drives the whole development process after that. Absolutely, absolutely. That is that is the cornerstone of, of everything, I think. Um, but. You know, um, I think we're all a little biased on that point. I'm sure folks would agree. Um, 
But when you live it, you learn it. And I think you all have demonstrated that you've lived it and learned it uh, quite well. I enjoyed having the opportunity to be the moderator here um, and learn from, from you. And I hope our, our audience feels the same way. It's an expansive topic. It's a critically important topic. Um, innovation and change is required. And as Joanna said, you cannot be afraid to challenge current thinking at, at the different agencies. The collaboration is better than it's ever been. They're open to, to changes. They recognize the need for changes. And I think they need our help in seeing where, where the changes are possible. Um, and each of you on this panel is a testament to that. Uh, I thank you for your time. I thank the audience for their time. And I would like to, again, just reiterate my thanks for everybody for joining the webinar, um, having this discussion about data-driven value proposition in, in the cell and gene therapy space. We're going to continue this discussion um, at our uh, in-person uh, Reuters Events Pharma USA, March uh, 26th and 27th in Philadelphia. I believe it's at the Philadelphia Convention Center. Don't, don't hold me to that. Um, it's a great venue, um, the Pharma, Pharma Events USA. If you haven't been, I encourage you to go. The collection of people that come together at this event is just exceptional. Every time um, that I've had, I did the digital one. I've done the, I did the in-person one last year and just tremendous learning happens over that two days. So I encourage you all to check it out. The links are, are posted. Um, so please check out the website for, for more information. And I believe you will be seeing myself and all of our panel members there in person. So please come and say hi um, and thank you all. And with that, we'll close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.